Good morning, Francie. Okay, we'll start. We'll review first and then I'll have you watch the video. Okay, ready. going to make it very, very good. Like, okay, let's review the laws that we've covered yesterday first before we move on. What's the first, first, one of the first laws enacted? <laughs> what was that? Federal Food and Drug Act. When was this enacted? 1906. What does it contain? What is it talking about? The truthful information. The information on a drug, okay, the product has to be truthful. That's the most important thing in it, right? Okay. When was this revised? Reenacted. 1938. And then the law became, what's the title of the law now? Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act. There's so many things that happened in 1938 when this law was reenacted. Okay. What's the big event first? In 1937. 100 people died, correct, Ashley, because of what? A drug that contained antifreeze, which is called, what's that antifreeze called? Diethylene glycol. Okay, so what were the changes from 1906 to 1938 on the Food uh, Federal Food Drug Act? Food and Drug Act. Okay. Federal Food and Drug Act. Give me some. Let's leave. What, what were the most important ones? You mentioned one Geneva. Let's leave to mention one. There's so many. I was talking about that for over and for almost an hour yesterday, the 1938. And that's where I ended actually. Okay. Let's talk about that for 40 minutes. Geneva said the FDA was created, correct? Okay, can you follow up on that one? No, you're staring at your notes. Okay, continue, Edwin. Um, oh, they had to um, submit a form on toxicology studies. Very good. The manufacturers are now required during this time, 1938, they started requiring manufacturers to submit toxicological studies, okay, to make sure that the drugs or products that they're putting out in the market is. Safe, the word now is safe, okay? 1906, truthful, 1938, safe, okay? That's major, okay? Edwin, there's another thing to that. On top of submitting toxicological studies, what do they require manufacturers as well? NDA, it's, a not, it's not the non-disclosure agreement, but it stands for, Vanessa? New drug application, any new product, new drug that we want to introduce to the market must have a new drug application first. They have to apply, submit this to the FDA before it gets tested on humans. Okay, what else? Clyde, give me another important thing that happened in 1938. Yeah, like. The warning label is still in effect. And what does the warning label for addictive, right? Addictive substances, what should it be? What should it say? It, says it should contain the word caution, a full word, the full sentence. Continue, Clyde. Caution. Caution um, requires the label maybe had it wrong. Correct. It has to have the complete words or statement, caution may be habit forming if the substance or the drug is what? Highly addictive or habit forming, the term implies, okay? What else, Vanessa, can you mention um, more changes or things that came in effect in 1938 with the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act?
Correct, it added cosmetics, tobacco products, and other products. Under that, which organization? Which organization was created that? The FDA. FDA stands for? Food and Drug Administration. Okay, uh, Kaylin, any more big things that happened, big events that happened in 1938 when they were enacted the 1906 Federal Food and Drug Act? Then in 1938, it became Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Correct, that's good. And Vanessa will present packaged inserts uh, Wednesday or Thursday. Our presentation is going to be on Wednesday and Thursday for all the assigned topics to you. Packaged insert, manufacturer, packaged insert on each of the drugs or bottles. That's the one. Stop the monograph, stop on top of your uh, bottles. Okay. Ashley, any more? Where did I end yesterday? Definition, right? Yeah, definition of adulterated and misbranded. Very good. Okay, adulterated and misbranded. They defined what adulterated drugs mean or what falls under adulterated products. What falls under misbranded products. Is that clear? Okay, give me examples of adulterated. What did I say is the magic word? You say adulterated. It's the first thing that comes to my mind. Dirty, right? Unsanitary, dirty. So give me examples of adulter considered adulterated products. Back to you, Geneva. Yeah, anything that has decayed or rotten substances. Edwin. Anything that's poisonous or harmful, Clyde. Unsafe color additives. Unsafe color additives. Because in 1938, okay, the food colorings, the dyes are actually regulated by the FDA. That's why the name FDNC yellow number, FDNC red number, because FDNC stands for Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Number because of the enactment in 1938, Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. What else is adulterated? Made under unsanitary condition. They just made it in the kitchen, in their house. It's not an approved location, right? In their backyard, in their garages. Can't be like that, okay? What else is adulterated? Can you name some more, Ashley? Foreign objects. Mm -hmm. Foreign objects in there. It's considered adulterated, right? Um, that's why we check for IV is before you actually use your vials, check for foreign matters in there. There's something floating in there. Okay. Um, what about misbranded? Kaylin, what are examples of products or drugs that are considered misbranded? Correct. False or leading mis <laughs> false or misleading information. False information. Say for example, uh, or misleading. Just not too long ago, these are um, causes of recall. Okay, uh, the manufacturer forgot to put wheat as an ingredient, which is important, right? Okay, you do that on purpose. Why is it important? Many people are allergic to wheat. Right? So that's important. That's just an example that happened not too long ago. Okay. What else? Anything else, Clyde? Back to you. Misbranded. What's considered misbranded? Okay. It is a habit forming substance or drug, but it did say that. It didn't say the caution, so that's misbranded, okay? Um, Geneva, anything else that's considered misbranded? Any Correct, okay. It is required for all products to have either the manufacturer or the distributor name, the office, and contact information. Here in the U.S., it's or. It's either manufacturer or distributor. In other countries, they're strict. It has to be both manufacturer and distributor. Okay, is that clear? Anything else, Edwin, that's considered misbranded? Um, 
Yes, incorrect quantity for the active ingredient. Or they have what? Alcohol in them, and they then include the amount of alcohol that's in the drug. So that's misbranded, omitting or deleting purposefully or unintentionally, okay, is considered misbranding. Is that clear? Major, 1906 to 1938. But in between those years, there's one important thing that happened in 1914. What act was enacted, Vanessa? Very good, the Harrison Narcotic Act. Okay, what does it what does it contain? What is it about? Opium. The control they started controlling the consumption of opium by requiring prescription. Opium is by prescription only, which leads me to the reason I wanted to go back to that is I wanted you to watch a video about the history of opium. Okay, because we have a big problem on opioid abuse here in the United States. Not only that, I mentioned to you about oh the Chinese trade, right? Based on history, that's how it started. But as I was looking into the history of opium, it actually started way, 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 way back. Okay. And nobody knows how long. So I'm going to let you watch the video of the history of opium. Okay. How it started, where it started. Okay. Um, and it's based off of the History Channel. And I forgot the name of the channel. I'm going to credit to the channel. Mind bending. It's from the channel mind bending, but it's actually based based off of the history channel. Okay, like so. You ready? Since it's Friday, let's try to make it Friday. You ready? Okay. I need pause. Depends on specific information. The end was the secret of happiness. I wish philosophers and speakers for so many ages have once discovered. Happiness might now be bought for a penny and carried in the waistcoat pocket. Forcible ecstasies might be forked up in the fine pocket. A piece of mind might be sent down in gallons by the way. This is an excerpt from the passage in Thomas McQuinty's 1821 autobiography, Confessions of an Opium. In it, as the name already reveals, De Quincey shares his experiences with opium. Opium, also known as Lacrima papularis or palm tears, is the name of the latex contained in the seed pod of the opium poppy. It's an extremely addictive opioid drug which has been influenced in world history since the 18th century. However, the history of opium dates way, way back. Although we can't exactly say where and when the opium poppy, which scientific name is papaveris, Somniferum comes from, we can say that the history of human interaction with poppy starts around 5000 BC. Poppy seeds dating back to that time were found in the Mediterranean region. Just as poppy is used in many ways today, the Neolithic people were already using it as a food source, as an anesthetic, as a ritual plant, and a in combination with candle. Later on, the 
first controlled cultivation of hardly occurred in Mesopotamia around 3400 BC by the Sumerians. Gave it the name Ujil, the joy In general, the Sumerian, Assyrian, Egyptian, Indian, Phenoan, Greek, Roman, Persian, and all the other civilizations of the ancient world were using opium as it was the most potent form of pain relief then available. In fact, opium was widely used for pain relief. Remember how I told you yesterday? It's like a pure all drug during this time, right? but I gave you the information that I didn't really say that it started in China, but back in history, um, it came from China to the United States or Western country. But it dates way, way, way back. Did you see? And so I said, I wanted to show you this video because I wanted to give you a better information, more accurate information about it. Okay? And I was searching, searching, searching. It's not a popular channel, but I don't care. Some of the information is correct. Okay. Until the introduction of morphine which in itself was directly isolated from opium. But more about that later. Between 400 and 1200 CE, opium was introduced to China by Arab traders who also taught them how to use opium recreationally. Opium was used by the Chinese both medically as well as recreationally, although the distinction wasn't always clear. It's sometimes more questionable uses in the so no, this is a, the point where I said, oh, the Chinese, right? It came from the Chinese making it to the Western countries. It was used recreationally. Now you can understand why that law in 1914 was what? Enacted because it was recreational, okay? And of course, it was abused, highly abused because of what? Access. Medicine have changed over time. The Eva's papyrus from around 1500 BC, for example, mentions a way to stop a crying child using the poppy. The modern times, on the other hand, it used to leave the patient. Did you hear that? Like a pacifier. They put the poppy plant on the breast of the mom and then breastfeeds the child to calm the child, to make the child stop crying. Do it after they were given opium to ease their pain. One such patient was Thomas de Quincy, the author of Confessions of an Opium Eater himself. Through the use of Paracelsus's Magdanum, a tincture containing 2% opium by weight, opium was reintroduced to Western medicine in 1527, for the first time since it fell in oblivion after the fall of the Roman Empire. Paracelsus is nowadays best known for being the source of the quote, all things are poisons, for there is nothing without poisonous qualities. It is only the dose which makes a thing poison. Correct. Okay. I wanted to pause here. All things are poison. That's why I always say everything in moderation. If you overdo something, if you overdo something, that's bad. Right? Then it becomes <laughs> poison. It depends on the amount that you consume. Okay. I talked about this oh, and, um, when it comes to food groups. Okay, We have two freshmen, but prior to that, I'm talking about, uh, I don't believe in taking out a food group, right? But I do believe in moderation, everything in moderation. Okay, And then here, it's talking about the dosage. You're not going to be addicted to something if it's just a little amount, but a little amount often, regularly, Every day, what becomes compounds and becomes addictive. So everything in moderation. This is very, very important. All things are poisonous, for there is nothing without poisonous qualities. It is only the dose which makes a thing poison. Paracelsus. Okay, addiction. I want to talk about addiction. Okay, we're not only getting addicted to drugs. What else? Anything can be abused, or you can be addicted to, okay? We have our own little addictions. I saw um, an ad yesterday. 1.8 billion people are on TikTok. 
And these are people addicted, a good amount of these people are addicted to TikTok. From the time they open their eyes to the time they close their eyes, which is funny, right? Touching it. That's an addiction, okay? Caffeine, okay? In the past, I had an addiction for caffeine. Doesn't matter if it's from Coca Cola, okay, or coffee, okay? So I tried to limit my intake on that. What are the other things that you can be addicted to? Like gambling. Gambling. Very good. Gambling. Like anything you can be addicted to. But what are the most popular ones that people get addicted to? Gambling. Okay. What else, Geneva? What was that? Soda. That's true. You know, where's my... Oh, it's not there. Coca-Cola. Is this still here? Coca-Cola formulation, fun fact, in the old days, had real cocaine. Okay. <laughs> That's why it's addictive. Okay. What else? What's in Coca-Cola? Not only cocaine in the old days, it's got caffeine, right? And I told you I was addicted to caffeine. Okay. What else? There you go, sugar. Very addictive, right? Not the sugar granules. I don't think anybody takes that, right? But in what form, sugar, Edwin? Sugar in what form? How do you get addicted to sugar? It's like a or like a added syrup, like um, high fructose corn syrup. Yes, high fructose corn syrup, which I, we have a lot of food that has high fructose corn syrup. Right. Okay. What form of sugar can people be addicted to? Think about food, Clyde. What form of sugar can we be addicted to? Candies, right? Okay, what about you, Vanessa? Pastries that has all those confectioner sugar, right? Chocolates, okay. What else? What was that? Cash. Um, you love chocolates. Every right? other day, I had a chocolate bar. What was that? There's natural sugars. There's artificial sugars, okay. But sugar in general is addictive. Okay. Your access to sugar is very, very easy, right? It's in your kitchen. Okay. What else can you be addicted to? Um, Kaylin. Smoking. True. Okay. Smoking. Cigarettes, tobacco products, marijuana. Doesn't matter if that's a vapor cigarette, right? Okay. Not only prescription drugs, right? Nowadays, we have that problem. People get addicted to prescription drugs, which is sad. Right? Because in the past, it's only street drugs that people get addicted to. Now it's prescription drugs. Okay, let's continue. So the amount, the dosage, the quantity is the problem, number one. Okay, but actually access is a bigger problem. Can you easily access it? Okay, that's why there are so many pharmacists, pharmacy technicians in trouble because of access. But what can we say about opium smoking more than chemicals? The latex are the young seeds of silver power plants contain a wide range of highly psychoactive alkaloids. Alkaloid is just a fancy name, naturally occurring compound which contains basic nitrogen atoms. These particular alkaloids found in poppy are known as opium. The aforementioned morphine, as well as thebane, codeine, apalarin, nocipine, orcopine, and many more compounds belong to those opiates. Okay, which one is the most popular or common or you're familiar with? Morphine, right? Why? Morphine is used for what? Pain. For pain, okay? I remember my mom, um, she was on morphine, okay? She, when I said my mom, my mama. Um, she passed away, she had breast cancer, and at that time there was no oxys, okay? So she was given morphine for pain, okay? They increased the dose, increased the dose, increased the dose, okay? The 
you have to remember that morphine is an opioid. That's another one that's familiar here. So pharmacists have to memorize, I don't like the word memorize, but know the chemical structure. I have this most common drugs, not only the controlled ones, but all. Um, we're tested. There's a structure here and then put it back. Okay. But we're not going to do that to you. Okay. But I want you to know okay, on the opioids, on this one, two, three, four, five, six structures, which one is the most popular? To, uh, it's morphine. And then there's another one that I think is popular to you guys. Cody. Very good. When or where do we use Cody? Like cough. Cough, you can see codeine and cough medications or cough formulations. Correct. Okay. So remember that they're, they're opioids. Okay. The penadrines, to which group morphine, codeine, and thibane belong, are the compounds with the strongest effect on the central nervous system, especially morphine and codeine, which in itself is broken down to morphine in the human liver are notorious for the sedative and pain relieving effects, as well as the incredibly fast developing dependence, which is reported to be excruciatingly hard to fight off, as withdrawal symptoms include restlessness, insomnia, and stomach pain. It is this downside to opium, which wasn't only able to destroy single people's lives, families, but even countries and empires. Don't believe me? In my last video, I already mentioned how, because of China's monopoly on tea and other soft after goods, Western countries trading with China were a major disadvantage. The trade with the tea and the British Empire actually led to the deflation of British silver currency. In the late 18th century, the financial situation of the East India Company was so bad that the British took drastic measures. <laughs> In addition to growing tea in their own colonies instead of buying it from China, the British also grew large quantities of opium in their own colonies. When the British began importing opium to China around 1781, Recreational use of opium, which at the time was prohibited, was still rare. However, recreational use of opium quickly took on, so that in 1838, the British were selling roughly 1,400 tons of opium a year to China. There, they could easily smoke for a pint in an opium there. These were illicit shops found at almost any corner in Chinese trading states. So the British to China, it's the other way around, right? These were illicit shops found at almost any corner in Chinese trading cities where one could go to consume opium. At first, patrons tended to spend only a couple hours there, enough for the drug to wear off for them. But later on, they found themselves unwillingly spending more and more time and money in those opium dens, as they were the only place to indulge in the ecstasy of opium. In a tragic sense of irony, these opium dens were also established in Western cities by Chinese immigrants. However, the problem with opium was never as severe in the West as it was in China. Opium completely took the Chinese officials by the storm. Thus, when the government crackdown started in 1838, 27% of the male population was supposedly already addicted to it. At first, the countermeasures only applied to the Chinese population. After those proved to be fairly infected, though, the Chinese government began to forcefully seize opium from British trade ships. The British, however, were not having any of this, and soon a couple of small skirmishes between troops of the nations developed into full-scale land and naval battles. Born was the first opium war in 1839. It ended in 1841 with the Peace Treaty of Nanking after a series of humiliating Chinese defeats. Regardless, China was still resisting. And so a second opium war began in 1856 and lasted four years. But to no avail, Western dominance over China, which lasted almost a hundred years, was already sealed by the smoke covering over all the opium. As it turned out, this was not the last time the poppy plant almost brought a country down to its knees. Yeah. 
This was 1800, huh? You tried to match it. Why 1914 parents are caught in that? Because it's a fact. Try to match it in history. The late 1970s, when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, the poppy fields proved once more to be an important strategical asset. This time, however, the tables were turned. It was the Afghan insurgents that financed their resistance by means of selling opium to Western countries, including the Soviet Union itself. This was one of the many causes of the heroin epidemic that hit the Western world hard. Anyways, this is a story for another day. Thanks for watching. Come back next week when I talk about the history. Now, if you if you want to watch it again, or this has been a popular channel, like what I said, that was very informative and history sounds about correct because I talked about history yesterday, right? That opium. And if I need to be corrected, I stand corrected because it is the start of China way, way, way. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Let's see your bagels. Yeah, that's why I said you might want to stop eating your bagels, like my former student who she said for 30, 40 something years, she's been eating bagels with poppy seed every single day of her life. And what happens? Of course, it compounds in your system, right? The amount of poppy seed. So she may get tested positive on any of these drugs when she goes for her 12 card um, drug test. Okay. Any questions? Is it law like history? That's why I said it's really, really boring. I wish my professor did it by a story, a history bag. So we didn't struggle. Like what I said, the class was called during my time, I think they still call it that way, pharmaceutical jurisprudence. Jurisprudence. Any questions? I want to give you time to work on your presentations for Wednesday and Thursday. But I want to get volunteers who wants to present on Wednesday and who wants to present on Thursday, no more than 15 minutes each. My only request is that Clyde and Leslie be back to back because of their topics. Volunteers? Wednesday, if you don't volunteer, okay. Leslie wants to go first, so Clyde, you will have to go next, okay? After that, who wants to go? Another one. It's seven of you. Okay. Um, Kaylin will go. Good job. So my, our freshmen are volunteering. So that's good. We'll talk more. What happens if I say your kids? Don't embarrass me even more. <laughs> Come on! You should be setting good examples here. You're going to be like, on to go, let's go, let's go. Okay, on the 16th, you guys have a meeting, seniors. Don't forget, um, 11 a.m. Remember the bridge program, 16th. Okay, that's why I scheduled the presentation Wednesday, which is the 17th, correct? Okay, Wednesday and Thursday. So, one more on Wednesday, one more. So we have Leslie, Clyde, and Kaylin. One more on Wednesday. Because that's only 45 minutes. So jump to presentation up the way. Okay, Vanessa. And then the rest of you will go the second day, which is Thursday. Okay, use this time to um, continue on with your research. Because I can't give you a lot of time with your research. So I'll try. You got 20 minutes. 